thank you all for being here. Thanks to my panel. Um, so as a reporter who covers the labor market and jobs, cybersecurity is an especially interesting area um, for me to cover because it's one of those rare places where jobs are growing a ton. But cybersecurity also has this unfortunate gap where <laughs> even as jobs grow, it's difficult sometimes to find the number of people needed to fill them. So according to some estimates, 40% of the cybersecurity jobs at the FBI are unfilled. And by some estimates, by 2020, there will be additional 1.5 million jobs in the field that there aren't skilled workers to fill. So I guess my first question for Dr. Frederick and Dr. Pollard is, as educators in DC, what do you think your role is in helping to kind of bridge this gap? I'll defer to Dr. Pollard. Important areas of conversation is halfway toward cybersecurity jobs. I think that many people think that a four-year degree is going to singularly be the way in which we will create this new workforce you're describing that we need. In fact, where I see the greatest opportunity is in the work that community colleges are doing in this space. My own organization, the two-year college right over the border in Maryland, has been very effective in the last three or four years of securing about $20 million in federal dollars to be able to create pathways towards cybersecurity. We're unique in this space because community colleges have several advantages for us. One is that we're tightly coupled to the community in which we serve, that being the business community and also uh, the uh, commerce and other areas that's important with that. Secondly is that we attract a student population that is traditionally underrepresented on is looking at the so if we look at our cybersecurity program at college, 50% white, with about 20% of the students women. And as a result of that, we're filling critical needs uh, that are traditionally underrepresented in terms of that population. And last but not least, I think there's an agility that we have. Uh, we tend to offer a number of these courses and it's through our workforce development. So one, we can create a, a strategy where you can have entry-level work but also continue to come back have a credentials to continue to grow in that space. So I think there's a, a uniqueness to the role that we play in here. I'm very grateful for the work that I think to, f to follow up on that, um, at Howard, obviously, we have a circumstance of the student population. Again, I would say 95% of the student population now is African American. And we have heavily invested around the area of STEM and trying to diversify. And so, for instance, one of our projects is Howard West, um, is a project with Google. We'll send 20-something students out on May 29th for 12-week um, sojourn, as it were, um, with Google, where they will get instruction um, from Google professors. We're also going to send faculty with them as well. At the end of the 12-week period, they'll get 12 credits. The goal is to really have that be a, a year-round experience. And I think it's important for the assimilation aspect of it. But I think to... Dr. Pollard's point, we have to reach back a little further. So we have a middle school on our campus. We've had it at middle school for in excess of 10 years now, focus on math and science. 95% um, of the students who graduate from there go on to college, and 60% of them do STEM disciplines. Uh, we feel that that's a very, very important part of what we're doing. So the next step of what we're going to do is to really make sure that they're getting programming and, and um, coding skills uh, at the middle school level. Our intent is to um, now at a high school, uh, I hope none of my faculty are here because of shared government. I, I, wanna, I don't want to think that I'm not um, bringing this to them as well. But <laughs> our intent is to have a high school as well. And so to bring all the way from middle school through to our undergrad and graduate experience, um, to have the pipeline really primed um, right on our campus right here in D.C. And I think that that's the way we have to do it. As a father of a 13-year-old, soon to be... 15 year old son and soon to be 11 year old daughter, I see the way they interact with technology and it's important. My wife has been computer science and as she says every day, you know, they have, you know, probably eight years of experience um, of using devices that she did not get in her four year degree um, time. And it's true, it's rapidly changing and we have to beat them uh, where they are. So I think it's very important that we add to that so we can decrease the numbers in the workforce. And the last thing I'll say about this is. I think when we examine the workforce as well, we have to be very careful about the data. There's a lot of focus on Silicon Valley, 
But the reality is, if you look at most of the data, I don't believe there are more than 400,000 jobs in all of Silicon Valley in this area. So we talk about it a lot, and we talk about needing to diversify it, but I'm not sure those numbers are truly there. As well as the way these companies uh, really grow is the other thing that we have to think about. When Snapchat launches its IPO, when you look at the number of employees they have and the value of the comp company, the capitalization, you go back and you compare that to General Electric, and you look at the number of years it took General Electric to get to where they were from a capitalization point of view and the number of employees, it's a very different world. So you can have a, a, a small company with 30 employees with billions of dollars now in this space. So when we talk about that you know, workforce, we also have to recognize that that workforce is not, these companies are not necessarily generating a lot of jobs per se, as much as they're generating opportunity, content, those types of things. And so we also have to look at that differently. So our students are also being exposed to entrepreneurship more so as well, so that they recognize that they themselves may have to create an opportunity. Yeah, well, let's talk about that a little more actually. So when we talk about the jobs that are available, especially in the cybersecurity field, the federal government is a major employer. They are hungry for those skills and those employees. And yet a lot of um, younger students, when you educate them in coding, when you educate them in computer science, they have in their minds, you know, Google, uh, Facebook, they want to go out to Silicon Valley. They want to go kind of like the bright, shiny names. One, is that where your students are talking about going? And two, how do you, combat that and kind of point them in the direction of where there may be more jobs. Our students who live in the community, they come from the community. 70% of the students go back to the cities they live in. So as a result of that, we spend a lot of time with small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and also large. So if you look at the a portfolio of connections that we have with Montgomery County. Uh, you know, there are 20,000 uh, vacancies right now in Maryland. And but here's the reality about that. You're not going to go and work at a place, uh, traditionally entry-level work, where you're going to go and uh, be the cybersecurity official for that particular entity. But cybersecurity is infused in every part of most entities, hospitals, retail, uh, you name them, they're all there. So we spend quite a bit of time helping our students understand what the reality is on the field. And most of them are wanting to come in and get work. They come here, they recognize this is an opportunity. And I think the other thing related is that we have to set them up for success in this space to teach them about continuous learning. Uh, most of our work that we do with companies right now is actually retraining their existing workers and then having ongoing professional development. That's an area of continuous focus for numbers. The federal government, um, I think, has been doing a good job of trying to reach out. Um, the FBI director, or the former FBI director, Comey, had me speak to the FBI, um, I believe in February, about diversity and the opportunities at the FBI. And, I mean, he, he obviously, I think, was very committed to recognizing that the majority of the agents um, are white, and when you look at cybersecurity and intelligence and those types of things across the world, um, it's very difficult to put a blonde, blue-eyed person in the middle of uh, an area where there aren't people who look like them. And you have to train a workforce that's more diverse if the country is safe and at the forefront. And so I think those types of outreach is, um, is important. We also try to expose our students to a wide variety of opportunities. There's no doubt. So just as I, when I took my son um, with me for the Google press conferences and we visited Facebook and Instagram and, and he wanted to take a look at Stanford as well, I mean, he is very much interested in computer science and those types of things. And yes, it's shiny and those campuses are great. There's no doubt about it. The benefits, the work at a place with, you know, 12, 15 different restaurants where you could eat free all day is, is not a... Um, <laughs> It's not a bad thing. So when they talk about the Facebook 15, it's real. Um, <laughs> it, it almost happened to us in one day. So it, it definitely, the benefits and so on are great. But the reality is, obviously, everyone can't work there. And I think that's one of the things I'm emphasizing to my students. The number of jobs that exist there is not what I think most Americans think about when we talk about Silicon Valley. Because we, we confuse those companies' economic strength with um, personnel, because that's how we've associated companies in the past, and that's just not a reality. So I really think being situated in D.C., 
this is a great opportunity for us. So I've been to the NSA, I've been to um, the FBI, and our intent is to really engage the federal government because I think we have an opportunity to place a lot of our students, but, and obviously Vice Admiral Carter, I'm sure, uh, with the, the folks that he has at his place, you know, has to be a, a good pump, a good priming. Well, point is also this idea of making sure that we understand what the profile is, the skill set is needed to do the job. I think we're working with the federal government to help them redefine the job description that says you must have a baccalaureate degree in X in order to step into these types of that you may not be well positioned to do that. The reality is helping people understand what the real profile, what the skill set is needed to actually step into this work and to assume that a baccalaureate degree in X is going to allow you to be able to do the type of work that's needed right now is really unrealistic. Ms. Admiral, I want to come to you for you to weigh in on this. How should we be marketing um, the opportunities that are available to people who are interested in community science in order to get them into places like Sure. So a lot of people here are aware that the U.S. Naval Academy has been around a long time, 171 years, and uh, our job is to produce officers, young men and women that are going to go serve in the Navy and the Marine Corps. So we make 1,000 of those a year. Our, our whole student body is 4,400. 75% uh, of them will go into the Navy as ensigns, and 25% go into the United States Marine Corps. Uh, we produce line officers. So these are men and women that are going to go serve in communities such as submarines, surface warfare, aviation, Navy SEAL, explosive ordnance disposal, and of course in the Marine Corps. What might surprise a lot of you is uh, now dating back just a couple of years, we're now sending officers who are fully physically qualified to go serve in the teeth of the Navy and the Marine Corps into the cyber community. So that's new. Uh, we have not historically done that. We have 25 different academic majors at the Naval Academy. And since 2013, we've had a cyber operations to include offensive and defense cybersecurity uh, application. It is uh, wildly popular. Uh, so we just graduated the first class last year that had that academic discipline, uh, and it's growing. This year, we'll graduate 60 out of the Navy uh, and Marine Corps officers that will have that academic discipline. And as the freshman class of 2020 is selecting their majors right now, uh, about 10% of the class is interested in this academic discipline. We're also the only school in the country that has mandatory cyber courses for its student undergraduate body. So we have a mandatory course that dates all the way back to 2011 for freshmen. I wish it was taught in elementary school. It's mostly based on cyber hygiene, uh, but then it exposes uh, very much into the technical side of how the internet works, uh, cyber operations, and then we actually replaced what used to be a mandatory electrical engineering course for juniors with a second cyber course. Uh, and that now starts to get into the war fighting elements of cyber operations uh, and where that actually merges with the electromagnetic spectrum, electronic warfare. Uh, and our midshipmen are very excited to be involved in that. So it's really kind of a two-pronged approach for the Naval Academy. It's preparing some percentage of our student body that will be cyber or even cryptological warfare officers, but then a broader cyber baseline education for everyone, regardless of what platform they're going to operate, whether they're going to be in the Navy or the Marine. I'm wondering if you guys feel like there are certain limitations to what can be taught on campus or within school versus on the job learning when it comes to cybersecurity. And I'm wondering how you guys would address that. And I want each of you to answer this because I'm interested in kind of the differing <laughs> approach. Yeah, I, I definitely think um, it's very different to learn some of those areas, in those technical areas here in D.C. versus what we're going to do with Howard West. That's, that's a major part of the reason that I signed that deal with Google. Um, I think the assimilation into the culture, understanding the technical aspects in a different way, the applications of them in a real-life uh, manner, I think is extremely important. Having said that, I mean, I'm still a practicing um, cancer surgeon, and my surgical training w was very different from what surgical training is today. Today we use a lot of simulation. Um, so the first time I put an IV in, it was a real life patient who had to be stuck a few times in order for me to get that <laughs> IV in. And today you have a mannequin arm um, that you can stick and draw blood back on. And so that, that ability to simulate the experience has really changed that every time I did a procedure for the first time. It was on a real-life patient. 
um, you know, 30, 20 something, 30 years ago. Whereas today, all of those things are done in a simulated exercise with mannequins that are obviously very expensive computers. Um, you can deliver a baby, um, et cetera. Having the ability to simulate that is extremely important. And I think especially in this area, that's an area that we really have to use those same simulation techniques in order to bring our folk up to speed so that they can really get the type of, of knowledge base they need. Having said that, though, I still feel strongly that with our Howard West project, the one thing for students of color in particular that you need to do is, it's, and it's almost impossible to do, is to simulate the environment. And working in those areas, it's very hard um, to not do that. So I showed up for the press conferences um, in Palo Alto dressed very much like this. And um, all of the Google representatives, as you can imagine, were wearing hoodies and T-shirts and jeans. And uh, my son, who was in a blazer, kept whispering to me, I told you I could wear my hoodie. And, uh, he, he, and he, he was right. But the fact of the matter is, unless my students see that every day and get uh, you know, simulated to the environment. So everything from just the culture of it to, you know, I think, simulating the, the exercises, we have to try to replicate. And, and, and I think there are several ways that we have to approach our cybersecurity programs, both our grant-funded programs, Cyber Advantage, and some of the things with our degree and non-degree programs, all have a practice-based component. One of the things that we've learned, we actually, people, multinational companies, we're working with them now, they are hiring people who have baccalaureate degrees from some of the best-named institutions, certainly Howard as well. <laughs> Uh, including <laughs> Howard and some Ivies, and they are recruiting them, and they are graduating with Mac bachelor's degrees, computer science, some version of that. Um, but they asked them to actually sit down, work for cybersecurity and other things. They can't do it uh, because they know conceptually it, but they have not spent in a work environment doing it. And they come to us, so we become the finishing school uh, for a number of large corporations. We have folks who can conceptually understand. They've never had the practical experience. Uh, we have an advisory of business us every year and three times a year to talk to us about what's happening in industry, how does that translate to the curriculum, and more importantly, your internships, your learning experience that we will provide for your students to be successful when they actually step out into work. Almost all of the students, say 95% of them, uh, before they complete this one-year program at the level, they already have a job off because we've been able to couple those together. The other thing that I think is important, the last point to make on this is just, I think we have to redefine our paradigm of who folks are who are stepping into this space. Uh, we had a panel of folks who came in, not doing a, one of them was Bucky Martin, and he was listening to a young man in the audience asking questions about uh, the industry and what things we could go forward. And he turned me and said, who is this fellow? I said, well, actually, he works for you now. Uh, he was a custodial worker at Lockheed Martin. He'd been there for a number of years, had been doing great work, and said, I want to become the guy in the So he started taking classes at and then he started taking classes. And now this young man is working at Lockheed Martin and plans to open up his own This is the reality of it. We're not going to talk about folks. We're going to say, hey, I'm going to do this work right out of looking for folks who work multiple ways. And Vice Admiral, I want you to weigh in on this. We're talking about some interesting simulation. Yeah. Oh, this is a fascinating time. In fact, the class that's graduating from us next, next week is arguably the last class that we could argue is part of the millennial generation. So the students that are coming in now are a new generation. They are called the Z generation. And uh, they think differently. Their, their families are different. They're much more worried about the cost of college. So obviously I am advantaged there slightly. Uh, but they also are brought up differently. They've never not been connected to the entire world. They actually look at more than five different devices per day, uh, as opposed to the millennial generation, which is used to looking at one or two per day, and about 10 hours of connected time per day. So at a place like the Naval Academy, where we consider ourselves a learning institution, you can't just teach in the classroom. Uh, it's got to be experienced. Uh, so cyber for us, whether it be cyber operations or cyber security, is done through the experience. And one of the most interesting events we do, whether it be send our most talented midshipmen to 
compete in policy contests. We actually compete at the international and national level policy contests at the undergraduate level is we actually uh, involve with all the other service academies to include the Canadians uh, in a cyber defense exercise. It's actually run by the National Security Agency, the NSA. They've been doing it for 15 years. And uh, each organization creates their own network. Uh, they operate on laptops in their versions of a war room, and the NSA for four days over 24 hours a day attacks those networks. And the midshipmen and the cadets from West Point, Air Force, Merchant Marine, Coast Guard, and the Canadians have to identify the threat, protect their network, and when they do get infiltrated, which they do, they have to capture it and put a patch on it. And uh, it's, it's an intense exercise. The teams are about 15 students each, and uh, the winner gets a trip to the White House. And there's actually a trophy. And it's bigger than the football commander-in-chief trophy. So <laughs> it's, it's perfect. And the Naval Academy just won that for the second time in the last three years. We're very proud. Uh, I just had the privilege of taking our team to the White House where they met with Vice President Mike Pence. And he engaged them for half an hour on this topic and how they do the business and why it's important. Uh, and then to take this to one step further, uh, for a lot of you that may have, have ever visited the Naval Academy historic site, we're only 338 acres. We're pretty small. So to put something up that's a new academic building is a big deal. And we've been working on this for a long time. So in 2015, we received $120 million from the American taxpayers through Congress to put up a new cyber education building. We broke ground this year on October 21st. So it's in the process of being built. It's designed. This is not a small structure. Five stories, 200,000 square foot plus structure. Uh, and if you hadn't heard, it's going to be named after Rear Admiral Grace Hopper, uh, the computer scientist who, who started uh, uh, working on the Mark I computer with Harvard uh, during World War II. First academic building to be named after a woman at any of the service academies in history. So we're proud of that heritage through uh, Rear Admiral Grace Hopper. Uh, this will become the cyber field of dreams. Uh, it will be an academic building. It'll be multidisciplinary. It will have uh, lab spaces as well as the first of a kind sensitive compartmented information facility to include its own lab spaces, academic uh, classrooms, and a 130 person auditorium where we can teach at the top classification levels. So we will be able to not only teach our midshipmen at the classified level, we'll be able to host conferences at the classified level. So this building will be finished at the end of 2019. I wish I could go faster, uh, but we're not waiting. We're doing uh, other programs. So you will see that coming very soon. It sounds like you guys have obviously invested a lot of time and effort in thinking about how to prepare your students to work in this field. I'm wondering, do students come in interested in this, or do you have to do a little convincing early in the game, and how, how do you do that? I'll just say from the Naval Academy, they, they want this from the get-go. Uh, as we talk about the workforce, you know, obviously we produce uh, officers for the Navy and the Marine Corps, but not all of them will stay in the Navy and the Marine Corps. So, you know, the second part of our mission is to inspire our young people to serve at the highest levels of responsibility and command citizenship and government. So, you know, obviously we want to see some of these men and women go on to be four-star admirals and generals, but we also know that they're going to be uh, corporate executives. They're going to be leading in Congress. Uh, in policy making, and the baseline of that is to understand uh, the cyber operations that we're going to have going well into the future. Students folks, they come, they know their jobs there. We've done a really good job in Maryland of creating the job market, the need for roughly 20,000 vacancies in Maryland. I think what we've had to, done a better job of I think nationally is articulating the cybersecurity is a field of study that impacts every industry, education, retail, medical. And I think the idea of just segmenting this one area and thinking that all cybersecurity is one cybersecurity is probably the greatest disservice. And as a result of that, we're doing a lot of work in the 12 space. We host cyber programs, cyber we have spaces within our campuses to bring folks on to help them understand and for that and to really get their hands dirty as it relates to cybersecurity. So I think uh, we're doing a very good job of that. I think there's awareness based as superintendent. 
this new generation, and I have a 10 year old, um, he doesn't understand why I can't figure out my iPhone. Uh, he can't understand why I just don't search it up and have an answer for it immediately. And his life revolves around these devices that are now in our home. Uh, and he's pushing me. So if we think about these traditionally aged students are coming in, uh, their expectations about cybersecurity and about the work in this field is very different than those of us who are leading organizations and businesses right now. They have a very different. Yeah, we, we, I certainly see um, our students with a major interest in this area. Um, last year, we took in 30 something students. This, and so, um, this year, we're going to take a 90 something. And a lot of that, I think, may have to do with our Howard West um, project. But we also started a Bison STEM Scholar program for students who are interested in the MD, PhD, or the PhD in STEM discipline. We send more African Americans to STEM doctorate programs in this country than anyone, uh, any, any other institution. In the past decade, we've sent more than Stanford, MIT, Harvard, and Yale combined. So our responsibility to the country in terms of making sure that um, African Americans in particular are getting into these doctorate programs is, is very, very strong. The other thing, the other aspect that we're exploring, and, and we just started some conversations with uh, Montgomery College, I feel strongly that the students who go to community colleges have a lot of academic potential. Um, they go for a variety of reasons, most of which are social circumstances. But with, and, and with that in mind, we are interested in a associate's degree to PhD program. Um, and we're looking to do that with a couple of local community colleges because I think that that pipeline, again, needs to be primed as far back as we can. We have a, a dual enrollment program with um, two of the high schools in D.C. that focus on STEM, McKinley Tech and Banneker, where we're bringing those students as, in as juniors, again, exposing them to things like computer science to get them interested in, in cybersecurity and then to get them. And the last thing I would say is that most of the kids like myself, um, when I went to college, we, you tend to have one big dream. And then that needs to get molded. My one big dream was to become a physician because I have sickle cell. Um, I had no interest in surgery. That's what a university is supposed to do. It's supposed to take that big dream and help mold it to suit either your capacity and or unleash your potential. And so I think when students come to us, they come to us with an interest in computer science or technology broadly. And it's our responsibility to let them know about the wide variety of opportunities that may exist, including cybersecurity, and I think we're trying to do that in a very aggressive way. Um, I just want to let the audience know I have a few more questions for our panelists, but right after that, we will be coming to you guys for questions. So get those ready, and somebody will be walking around with a mic. Um, so another question that I have, I want to go back to the point of diversity. So you guys are doing quite a bit to move the needle on the pipeline of who ends up in these jobs. I'm wondering what lessons you could give to other schools that aren't powered that aren't necessarily in the same communities about attracting women and minorities to this. That's leadership. Um, you have to demonstrate that you have a true commitment to what it is you're doing. So although Howard University does a good job with African-American students in general, I would say that although our undergrad is 65 to 70% uh, female, our leadership hasn't reflected that. I'm the 17th president of the institution. We haven't had a female president. Um, if, if I, not that I would have a say in the matter, but I would love to see my, the 18th president of Howard be a woman. Now, in order for that to happen, we started with one female dean when I started, and I'm happy to say as of hopefully next week, hopefully by the time I get back to my office, she would have signed her, her offer letter. <laughs> um, I have, by next week, I would have eight, seven female deans of my 13 deans. We would have a majority decanal population of women deans. That's unprecedented. Uh, when you look across higher ed, and I think, but that then sends a message to the rest of the community that we are very serious about this. And as we bring students in, we then have to make sure that we message that. It is very different if they show up and they see the leadership of the university that reflect that half of my cabinet are also women as well. And we have to keep doing that. Most of the male students who come to us, and when you look at statistics on African-American males, this is going to surprise you. The African-American males who come to Howard University actually are performing better on the SAT and in their GPA than the women, but they are going to what I call the Wall Street jobs, right? They, they're doing the Wall Street majors, finance, accounting. They're not necessarily going into STEM. We have a woman in STEM project on our campus as well. 
to help with that pipeline to make sure that women are getting promoted um, as well. And so I think it, it, you have to have a very systematic approach and it has to start with the leadership and the message has to be consistent and constant that this is what we are about. And once they see other fields, so surgery at Howard, I would argue that the surgery department at Howard has produced more African-American female surgeons than any one single institution in this country. And if you think we only graduate four to six surgeons a year, that's a very, very telling statistic. Um, but again, that burden can't be carried by just one institution. It has to be spread out. And so the last part I would say is our ability to collaborate with others. And that's the other thing that we've been working on. East Carolina University has been to our campus to try to get more of our students to join their graduate and professional program. So we're going to sign an agreement with them soon. We're going to have MD Anderson um, visits with us in the next month or so for that same purpose. And we're going to continue to do that and work collaboratively with other institutions because we do have a pipeline. But to your point, we have to make sure that we brought that to other institutions. But I, I, I have to underscore that it has to start with the leader. Very briefly, I would say that you have to have leadership is important. We also emphasize faculty uh, that look and reflect the students that we serve, and they also have experience working in business and industry. That's very key to us as an organization. Uh, secondly, we partner with community entities that would help bring populations to us in trusted ways. I think the assumption is that for higher education, uh, that we are already in these communities. The reality is that uh, there are parts of our community that we don't touch, and we have to work with entities that are already there and help bring them there. The number one barrier to higher education is poverty. Um, if, we, if we don't address that, the reality is that folks can't afford to go to school, and most people cannot afford to go into a four-year baccalaureate full-time track. Half of undergraduates in this country attend college, and they're going part-time. The reality is they're working and they're going to school. They have complex lives. So if we continue to design academic programs that don't reflect who our students are right now, we, are, we will continue to have one point some odd million anticipated vacancies by 2019. The last thing that I'll say is that we also have to help prepare populations for the work they're going to do. Give them practicum experiences where they actually work in the industries, small, medium, and large size corporations, that we also talk about the preparation, having someone understand what clearance means and understanding what that process is going to take, not months, but years to get it. And last but not least, having career navigators. We have those in our programs, and they wrap around the faculty, the students in the industry to help direct students into those vacancies that are existing. Very successful model because we have this multi to it. Yeah. It might surprise a lot of people to know that the, this idea of diversity coming from every voting district in the country matters greatly to us in the United States. We have a responsibility to make our Navy, our Marine Corps, and quite honestly, our higher department of defense reflect the uh, The good news is, is they're applying to come to a place like the Naval Academy. Uh, we're seeing record numbers of applications, the uh, rise in women, and uh, ethnic diversity applying to the Naval Academy is the highest we've ever seen. The class coming in and the class of 2021 will maintain us well over 25% of the brigade and midshipmen being women. And this incoming class will be the most ethnically diverse we've ever had in our 171-year history this year. Um, and uh, those that are coming to the Naval Academy with no quota system, this is just the best to apply, are graduating nearly at 90% from the day that they are inducted. Uh, it's an incredible number uh, that we're seeing. Our African-American population last year graduated at 92% from the Naval Academy. Uh, this year, we represent the highest yield or accept rate of any school in the country. Uh, close to 89% of all the students that we gave an offer to to the Naval Academy said yes. Uh, it's an incredibly high number. For uh, To put it into context, the Ivy League schools are usually in the high 70s, low 80s. Um, and uh, for the ethnic diversity groups that we've made offers to, they were well into the mid-90s that said yes to come to the Naval Academy. So we are enjoying a wonderful renaissance period where people want to come and serve the Naval Academy. All right. I think we have time for one of the questions. First break. Jackson, I'm from Howard University School of Law. Um, I'm one of those rare African Americans who's interested in cybersecurity. Um, however, uh, you all have talked a little bit about 
sort of the diversity in the field, but I want to ask about intersectionality. I know that you've talked about how it is that cybersecurity involves every single industry, but for someone like me who's a law student um, or other areas like business, how can we get involved in, or how is higher education looking at cybersecurity for the various fields? One of the issues that we've talked about today is just how public policy isn't keeping up with the needs for cybersecurity, and that's a very big um, field of students that are going to be going into that workforce very shortly. How is higher education dealing with that? Great question. How would university question, I would, I would say. Uh, um, Howard West, our project where we're sending our computer science students, um, we're actually looking at sending business students and law students as well for the very reason that you just mentioned. Uh, we recognize that there's a lot of intersectionality, and so having collaboration is going to be key. This fall, we're going to start what I would describe as a little bit of an experiment where even getting how we provide instruction today, I think, is a little archaic. So we're going to have speech professors with the history professors, et cetera. But one of the things we're looking at as well is to have more computer science and law, computer science and business, and have those classes taught together for the purpose of doing that. The last thing I would say is the other thing that because computers are going to affect everything that we do, we are looking at a mandatory course in computer science, not just for the, the students, but also for faculty in terms of orientation to bring them up to speed with where computer science is, et cetera. So I think all of those are really going to try to help us fill the gap uh, with respect to the intersection. Okay, thanks so much to the panel and to the audience for listening. Hope you guys have a great day.